Hi guys, it's Caroline Career and Leadership Coach and today I have Anna Glynn with me and she is a well-being and positive psychologist and she's going to tell us a little bit how we can actually build our resilience uh, in these uncertain times. So welcome to the show, Anna. Thanks, Caroline. Hello, everyone. And yeah, very much looking forward to being here. Brilliant. So um, I was hoping to give a little bit of an idea of what your background is. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what your background is, Anna? Yeah, sure. So I guess firstly, um, I, I, I might make a little bit of a correction there. So I'm not a positive psychologist because um, I'm not actually registered as a psychologist. However, I'm someone that um, teaches people positive psychology and I'm an expert on well-being, particularly in the workplace. Um, so with that, I guess, um, you know, based on my experiences from working in the corporate sector for almost a decade, um, plus my extensive studies in positive psychology um, over recent years, what I now do is share that as much as possible with you know individuals, teams and organisations to help them thrive. So why did you make the switch? Why from, from corporate, being in the corporate world to, to this? What, 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 what went on with you? <laughs> Great question, Caroline. Um, and something I you know sort of reflect on quite regularly. Um, I guess where I, I came across positive psychology was through my own search. Um, I'd recently become a people leader. So I was managing a team of eight uh, sales consultants. And suddenly I was responsible you know, for driving their motivation, influencing their behavior. I was uh, you know, in charge of their engagement and their performance and you know, helping take care of their well-being. Um, and despite you know, having been through so many different workshops and uh, you know, um, uh, you know, training around you know, those, those skills that we need within the workplace, I didn't have that confidence or, or felt like I had the, the right skills, you know, those what we traditionally might call the soft skills, which we yeah. know are those hard skills. Uh, so through my own investigations, I started to explore, uh, you know, coaching as a style of leadership. I started looking at, you know, motivation and, and you know, how to drive engagement and performance and influencing skills, et cetera. And then I started to sort of, you know, go down the rabbit hole and I came across this whole field, which is called positive psychology. Uh, mm -hmm. And I came across this man called Marty Seligman, who's sort of one of the founding fathers of positive psychology. And all of a sudden I started to learn sort of, you know, different, I guess, not different approaches, but, um, you know, things that do sound quite intuitive to us um, and, and uh, you know, different strategies and interventions that I, heard, I hadn't heard of before. And I started to apply them with my own team. So things like, you know, uncovering their strengths and using those to drive engagement and performance. Mm -hmm. And I started to really see a difference um, and and realise that this was probably something that I wanted to learn more about, which is then when I started to embark on the studies um, in positive psychology. That it's such a, an interesting field because um, as a HR and as a, a recruiter, what you see is that people get promoted, but often they don't get the right foundation in how to be a leader so it's so easy to be like it's not i should rephrase that it's not easy to be a leader uh, or a manager but it's like so it's more a tick box like you be you are a manager by doing this 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 and you have their kpis that you have to check and you have to do this and and you can tick it off but being a true leader there's so many aspects that are that are part of it and like you don't not a lot of people or companies invest in you really getting those skills and capabilities like you're just like promoted because you're good at your job like yeah go off and do it now show other people to do it so having that motivation and that engagement of and being interested in it it's like yeah it's very 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 difficult um absolutely so what do you see at the moment from from your point of view what's happening from from a from your point of view sure well you know it goes without saying that this has probably been the most challenging year for the majority of us uh yeah. you know all across the world we've all been impacted by this global pandemic um particularly at the moment uh those like me who are still in lockdown down in melbourne and you know still facing probably another sort of six or so weeks of restrictions so what we're noticing um you know shouldn't come as a surprise is that 
you know, the majority of us um, or many more of us are actually struggling at the moment um, as opposed to probably pre-COVID times. And we're certainly, um, you know, noticing that less people are actually thriving at the moment as well. Um, so, you know, there's a lot more, um, you know, struggle around um, people feeling quite isolated and lonely. Again, talking to those probably based in Melbourne, still under those lockdown restrictions. We're seeing people that are quite, you know, disengaged and not that motivated in their work. Um, people that are really fatigued. So Zoom um, and video conferencing, you know, although it's got so many great benefits, it's actually really taxing on our brains and it makes us much more tired at the end of the day. Um, you know, we're also finding people are always on. You know, there's this sort of, um, for some people, this expectation that because they are working from home and we've blurred those lines between, you know, home life and work life that, um, you know, all of a sudden they might have to actually be responding to emails late at night. Um, yeah. And for some, we've had, you know, sort of those increased uh, workloads as well. So there's a lot of people that unfortunately are struggling at this time. But on the flip side, we've seen some people that have, you know, sort of done quite well or they're living well despite the struggle and also potentially, um, you know, thriving during this time. Um, you know, I've heard of people that are sleeping better. They're getting time to exercise each day, which is excellent. They're having, yeah. they've got, you know, stronger relationships with those they live with. Um, they've found new purposes and they're, and they're learning new skills. So although there's a lot of people struggling, there's still some people doing well um, despite the challenges. Yeah, I had a client actually the other day saying to to me like, Caroline, I decided to stop. And I said like, What did you? What are you going to stop? And she was like, I'm. Go I decided to stop like being really um, tough on myself and to really appreciate more like that. I now have time to walk my dog and that I now have time to read the books that I wanted to read and that I now have time to have family dinners that I thought we would never have. And she said like. Um, because we always were out working, coming home later than our kids were and stuff like that. She said, like, so I started to 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 stop wishing for things to go back to normal and really more appreciating what is and what this situation has to offer. So it's really making that shift in terms of how you view things and how you can make that work for you instead of kicking yourself too hard. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And for so many people, you know, if they've had sort of that right mindset or that growth mindset throughout this time, they would have seen that, you know, 2020, despite the challenges, has been an incredible year for sort of positive change and, and growth and development. Um, you know, so for, for certainly so, so many, as I said before, they're going to come out of this much stronger than perhaps pre-COVID times, given what we've all been through. So what do you see as the traps? What do you see like uh, how, where people go wrong? <laughs> yeah, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say necessarily go wrong, but I think, you know, some definitely, you know, good pointers in the right direction is, again, considering your mindset, um, you know, how, how do you sort of view challenges? Um, there's typically those two types of mindsets we talk about. There's that fixed where, you know, you, you consider your sort of traits or your skill set as um, something that can't be developed. So when you face challenges, you know, you, you find it hard to actually see a way through them. Yet people, on the other hand, who have a growth mindset um, believe that their skills and their intelligence and their talents, abilities, et cetera, can be developed. So when they see sort of a, a challenge, they don't see it as a threat. They see it as an opportunity to, to grow, develop, to build a new skill set. So I think for people that have that the growth mindset, um, Hopefully that's something that's been, um, you know, carried them through, um, you know, these ongoing challenges that we face. And then the other thing um, that I've sort of returned to is this idea about focusing on what we, you know, can control versus what we can't control. Um, you know, when we have our minds sort of focused on all these factors that are outside of our control, they actually add further to our levels of stress. And, you know, really there's no point in, in us focusing on these things because we have no control over them. So I want to sort of um, illustrate this point a bit, if I can, Caroline, with um, a slide, because I think, you know, the, um, you know, I've sort of populated it based on some of those things that, you know, we are worried about right now versus those things that we do have control over. Yeah. So many people on the line will be familiar with Stephen Covey's work and certainly his book, you know, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So this circles concept actually came out of that book. And at the start of the year when, you know, the COVID hit and um, all of a sudden our worlds were sort of changed, 
I started to, or I returned to the circles, I guess, and I started to think about, yeah, so what are these things that sort of are outside our control? Mm -hmm. So what you can see listed on the screen here are probably, you know, some of those things that did impact Melbourne more recently, like, you know, the supply, supply of toilet, of toilet paper. paper. I love it. <laughs> that was a really big concern for us twice this year, you know, at the yeah. start of the year and then, you know, um, certainly a couple of months ago when we returned to lockdown, you know, there was a big, yeah. big shortage. I, for one, was sitting on about one roll for, for a while there and it was quite, quite concerning. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a great example. Then there's things like the government restrictions. Um, you know, then there's things we think about like, you know, the actions of others or the thoughts of others. Um, you know, things like technology. You and I were having that discussion about, you know, the, the pitfalls of technology at the moment when we're running so many things virtually. Yeah. Um, you know, things like natural disasters. These are all the things that are quite common to people and, and keep them up at night, but we really don't have any control over them. So as I was saying earlier, there's, you know, no point in us investing time, effort or energy here because all it does is actually contribute further to our levels of stress. Yeah. Whereas what Covey suggests is that, you know, proactive people, they tend to focus on that inner circle. And these are all the things that are in their circle of influence. So all the factors that they can control. Yeah. And again, this is something I've just populated with things um, that I believe people could be focusing on now, despite the challenges that are actually going to enable them to, to you know, sort of navigate the challenges ahead. So things you see listed there are, you know, connecting with others, um, controlling the time spent on media, given it is so negative at the moment, um, that, you know, the mindset, uh, which I spoke about earlier, you know, performing acts of kindness or um, trying to make people laugh through humour, um, you know, expressing gratitude, that's a that's a mega strategy for being happier and, and having greater well-being, making yeah. sure you've got a good routine. I um, started being, journaling. Like oh, I have my good. journal on on gratitude and like uh, yeah yeah and what I appreciate in life. So yes, definitely. So <laughs> excellent. Yes, and yesterday was World Gratitude Day, and you know if if anyone you know sort of wants to try those gratitude um or, or ways to practice gratitude, journaling is an excellent one. Yeah. Um. You know something I always suggest is just capturing you know three good things at the end of each day. You know what went well that day for you. Um. That's one of those sort of tried and tested interventions from the positive psychology field that we've, um, you know, seen through various studies has has such incredible positive benefits for people who practice it over the over the longer term. So I'm so pleased that that's something you practice as well, Caroline. <laughs> uh, it's something like uh, that I started, and I actually the time spent on media, like I I actually stopped watching the news, and like uh, like we used to watch the project. Uh, sometimes we still do, but like all these how doom and gloom messages and even though i don't want to be an ostrich like putting my head in the sand and being ignorant about whatever the, everything that's going on in the world like i also want to protect myself in terms of like focusing on my energy and what i put out in the world and what what, what the impact that i can make because i have to hold space and everybody like in the world needs to hold space whether it's for your own kids for your family for your friends for your parents like and for me it's also for for my community it's like uh so i have to i can't be doom and gloom <laughs> so i need i want to be protect myself in terms of like over overspending time on social media like or on media like and seeing everything on facebook and it's just all these messages like um yeah so i definitely agree yeah with it's, you on it's, that. it's one of those things where it sounds quite bizarre when i suggest it but i actually say to people you know schedule time to worry so work out sort of what time of the day is best for you to, to absorb the news because, like you said, you know, you, you do need to, to be aware of what's going on and you can't be an ostrich with your, your head in the sand. But, but work out the times of day, whether it's first thing in the morning or, you know, last, um, you know, last thing at night and, and you know, tune into the news. Um, yeah. But make sure, you know, it's a credible source, obviously, where, you know, you're getting um, that information from. But if yeah. you're someone that's got, you know, sort of those notifications going off, off on your phone all day from news outlets, you know, yeah. when it's negative, all it does is it actually just, you know, zaps your energy and um, it makes it really hard when you come back to whatever you're doing to be really engaged because you're actually, um, you know, absorbing all that negativity, which we know, you know, fuels us with uh, negative emotions, um, which, which 
isn't a good thing, unfortunately, for things like, you know, engagement and our performance. So, you know, if you haven't already, you know, turn off the notifications and, and you know, think about what's that time I'm going to schedule for me to be um, absorbing that news each day. Yeah, and spending that time. And uh, when you talk about gratitude, um, I think the best way, and this goes in a territory that I'm completely unfam not unfamiliar, I'm fascinated with, but I'm not an expert uh, by all means. Uh, but gr doing gratitude, uh, lasting in the evening before you go to bed, like you said, so writing the three things uh, uh, down or anything like that, because like oh, apparently, it talks to your uh, subconscious and so you go to it with a very different mindset than uh, when you start worrying about things and that will like um, again have an impact on how you feel uh, during your sleep and uh, how you get energy and rejuvenate and uh, then in the morning when you wake up. So don't know if that's true. Tell me. <laughs> it, it, you're you're absolutely true. And um, what's really interesting is, you know, I talk to people about the science behind these interventions and, you know, clinical trials will tell us all the great benefits that come from doing an intervention like Three Good Things. But I absolutely love them. You know, I talk to people about it and then they come back to me and they'll say, oh, my goodness, I'm sleeping better. I'm waking up more energetic. I'm noticing more of the positives in, in my life as opposed to all the negatives. I'm like, well, now you're living out, you know, what the science is telling us. So, yeah, um, yeah absolutely, it's about trying these things and saying, well, what are the benefits um, for yourself? And some things won't work for everything, but it's about just, you know, being open-minded and curious and, and giving them a try and seeing, you know, what, what um, occurs. Why do people think don't do them? Because it's too simple. Like I know that people say, "Oh, I don't." I I used to be one of those that said, "Ah, oh, I don't meditate. I don't journal. I don't do that." <laughs> Why do you think that is? From your experience, I think I think like anything, you know, change is hard. Even even positive change. And one of my biggest learnings is is not about making change, um, you know, a really sort of big impact or or something quite dramatic that's going to, um, you know, really you know change your day to day, but it's about sort of taking small steps or small changes each day to making something into more of you know a habit, so that you know over time it just sort of becomes second nature to you, like brushing your teeth. Um, I'm the same, you know. I was one of those people that you know, did used to practice meditation, you know, quite consistently um, a few years back. These days, you know, unfortunately, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm not someone that, you know, maybe has the time or the motivation to do that. But the way that I'm practicing mindfulness at the moment is, you know, during my lunch break, um, if the weather's good, I go and sit in my backyard. And after I finish eating, I simply take about five minutes just to focus on, you know, what are three things I can see? three things I can hear and three things I can smell. And even if that's just for five minutes, um, you know, that's actually restoring and recharging myself after the morning that I've, I've just had and preparing myself for whatever's come ne comes next. So, yeah. you know, things like mindfulness don't have to be something that take hours and hours. They can be something that's done in as simple as sort of, you know, a five minute activity and in my backyard, not sort of some, you know, beautiful meditation room. <laughs> and you 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 mentioned or you highlighted a really good point is that uh it's different for everyone um i i recently got in the um in the practice and i actually kind of kind of enjoy it of uh breathing exercises and so it's 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 a, a form like also like to bring you back to the presence and i think like all the mindfulness and uh, meditation uh, i also do uh kundalini yoga which is awesome <laughs> I, i'm throwing everything at it Anna. <laughs> but it's it's the only thing what it's meant to do is uh everything is bringing you back to the present moment and really like teaching you to appreciate what you have and be like in the moment and creating that gap from not thinking about the past not thinking worrying about the future and just like to be is that is that about right Oh, absolutely. You're spot on. So mindfulness is exactly that. It's about being in the pr present moment in an accepting and non-judgmental -judg way. And it's when you're there, you know, so focused on the present, you can't think about the past or the future. So, yeah. you know, meditation is a form of mindfulness. But as you said, you know, breathing activities, um, you know, I've also done a, an activity where, 
you know, I, I've given students a piece of chocolate and they've had to do sort of an activity around mm. observing and tasting the chocolate before actually, you know, consuming it. Um, you know, all there's all these great ways that we can actually practice mindfulness. But as you said, it's just about, you know, making sure that your mind is yet focused on that present. And when it's there, it's, you know, it's controlled in a way that it's not distracted by other things like your past or your future. Yeah, exactly. So I like another thing that you mentioned on your circle here is routine. So how does this like fit into a routine and how can people start creating and what's the importance of a routines? Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So I think when we, you know, went sort of, uh, you know, a couple of, or well, probably six months ago now, you know, first went into that lockdown, um, there was a lot of novelties around working from home and, and you know, uh, those sorts of things, having access to, you know, doing, um, you know, our, our chores, but then also, you know, potentially, you know, spending lunch times watching TV, et cetera. Um, you know, it was it was unfamiliar and it was it was a little bit exciting for some people. Um, but, you know, that novelty started to wear off and we noticed, obviously, the impacts that that was having on people's um, well-being and, and mental health. And what's really important for us as humans is to sort of, um, you know, stick to those routines that, um, you know, we're used to because that, that gives us that sense of security um, when, you know, there is, again, so much, you know, sort of stress and anxiousness around us. So, you know, what I was talking to people about was, just thinking about, well, what is your new working from home routine? Now, obviously, that is for yeah. most people not going to be the same as what it was like, you know, pre-COVID. Um, people at home now have, you know, children at home. They might be looking after relatives or neighbours as well. Um, they might have their partners, you know, in the room next door. So that r routine, you know, it would be um, sort of remiss of us to think that it was going to be the same. But it was about thinking about, well, what's that routine that best works for you? You know, if you're someone that exercises each day in the morning, you know, keeping that up or keeping that up at night, um, trying to take the lunch breaks, trying to establish those boundaries between, you know, work and home. So if that's, you know, giving yourself a start time and an end time and, and making sure you're having those regular breaks throughout the day, which we, we know we need more of because we're so fatigued again from sort of the overwhelming number of, you know, virtual conference meetings we're, we're having. So mm. it was really important, yeah, for, for people to consider, well, what is that routine? Maybe even, you know, sharing it with their, their managers. Um, but just yeah. make sure that they're trying to follow that. Yes. Um, and I think, like, because there's a lot of change happening. So it's not just change. So a lot of people are quite good with change, like if it's just one aspect. But now we're talking about, like, multiple areas of our life and our career. So it's very different, even though you might say like, I'm a resilient, I, I can manage, I'm agile, I'm, I can manage the change. Like uh, this is a whole new level. It's like change, like suddenly your partner is working from home. So suddenly you have to homeschool. So that's in your personal life. Suddenly you have to manage a team virtually, like you might be new in your job, you might be in between jobs. So, 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 so many things are, changing and then actually the way you go shopping you can't even see or you can't even see your family and friends because i have international my family is like overseas so i can't jump on a plane anymore so what if everything has changed so much so and that routine that you talk about is going to pro probably give you a sense of like a sense of control is is that mm. right anna yeah absolutely that sense of control that sense of feeling safe and, and secure, you know, our brains love that when we've sort of got yeah. that routine and that, that um, you know, the, the normal behaviours that we're used to, yeah, it, it makes us feel comfortable. So if how, so oh, I have a couple of questions, my mind is going, <laughs> um, <laughs> so first of all, how can people identify where they're at? Because you might say like, okay, I do, um, um, I work on my mindset, I do meditation, but I'm like, are they really then in a in a in a positive mindset, or um, like, what can they start to do to first assess where they are? Is there a scale that you're more like uh, in control, or whatever it is that you're more positive, or like, what, where to start? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think I think it's really up to that individual, and you've raised a really good point. Is that um, 
you know, what's become quite apparent during the last sort of six months or so is that sometimes people, you know, we might be checking in with others. Um, you know, we, we celebrated Are You OK Day recently in Australia um, a couple of weeks ago, which is about, you know, checking in on other people. But sometimes what we forget to do is actually ask, you know, how are we, how, how, how am I, you know, how am I going as as a as an individual at the moment? Um, and again, this is something that, you know, I've been asking a lot at the start of sessions I've been running and asking people just to um, identify what's the emotion you're experiencing right now. Mm. And it's really a really powerful exercise because when you do it with groups, you you actually begin to notice that there's such a mixed range of emotions that, you know, the team, one team can be feeling at any one time. Um, you know, you'll see a whole lot of sort of positive emotions, but on the flip side, you'll sort of st still see a whole lot of negative emotions that are experiencing. Yeah. Um, and that just, you know, it, it just paints such a, a an interesting picture on the fact that people could be, you know, quite similar in similar roles, et cetera but yet uh, are experiencing a whole range of different emotions at that particular time. Yeah. So I think, you know, that first step is definitely checking in, you know, where are you at, how are you feeling, and and maybe even tracking that on, you know, sort of a scale of zero to 10 over time as well. So basically using your emotions to firstly assess where you're at and, but okay, so this is, this is a question that I, I see people struggle with all the time. It's like, you're so good in putting on a performance and hiding your emotions because in the workplace that's most of the time what people need, learn to do uh like even as a kid it's like you have to be tough enough you're a boy you're a girl you can't like so people start to uh, be very comfortable in not be not being connected with their emotions and really suppressing them so and now in this pandemic, it's so important to use their emotions. So how can they re-establish that connection? Yeah, you've, you've touched on a really good point. And I think it comes down to being, you know, honest with yourself. Um, so, you know, completing this sort of exercise can be something that's confidential if you don't feel secure sharing it with others and obviously seeking that support um, if you need. Uh, but certainly in sort of a team or workplace environment, um, this is where we want to, you know, ensure that we've got that psychological safety, that that's present within teams so they can share those worries and concerns and stresses and, and not feel like they're being judged or they might be, you know, reprimanded for it. Um, yeah. So the teams that I've seen, you know, actually do quite well, um, you know, during this, this challenging time are those that are really open with the fact that they might not be having a great day and, you know, oh, I'm having a really um, terrible hour and, and expressing that. Um, and on the flip side, you know, perhaps, um, you know, outlining, um, you know, I'm having I'm having a good day today, but yesterday wasn't so great. Um, yeah. And, and you know, getting leaders to sort of share those vulnerabilities um, and allowing that safe space for people to have um, that commentary um, is, is, you know, it can be so incredible. We know, um, you know, that can help people feel so much more safe and secure and then that can have so many ongoing positive uh, effects as well. So is it then also on the flip side, very important that people start to develop compassion for, for others and to really understand like, okay, because instead of judging them that like, oh my God, they're moody, oh my God, they're like whatever it is that they're doing to actually develop a compassion like an empathy for the other person to understand where they're coming from and they that there might be an underlining thing is that they they might not even be aware of themselves that they're struggling with something because like i said you're so used to suppressing those emotions then it might emancipate or manifest in in other ways than before you can articulate it does that make sense <laughs> yes it does and you've sort of hit the nail on the head of two things that i've been talking uh to leaders and teams about is again coming back to you know those those hard skills that we need to develop i you know strongly believe that we're seeing a lot, lot more leaders express that empathy and that compassion and i think they're the skills that you know all leaders need going forward um if they don't have them already is is developing ways that they can sort of um, you know, deal with the emotions that their team might be experiencing and, and um, you know, sort of adjust accordingly um, as well, you know, ensuring there's that psychological safety. Um, but likewise, you know, that's sort of, you know, a lot for leaders to take on. So making sure that they are prioritising um, their own self-care and, you know, putting their oxygen masks on first because they're not going to be the best leader that they can be for their team um, if, if they're flailing at the same time. 
So as a leader, if you say, if you have never dealt with those things before, what are the, because you're talking about security nets and or safety nets, like for people to actually express their, their emotions or the situation, what, like what forms can they do? Can you explore as a leader if you have like no idea about how to do that? And your company yeah, sure. is not providing an ERP system where you actually can <laughs> rely on. Yeah, no, um, Caroline, that's a really good point. And I think, you know, one of the things that I would suggest to people is this isn't something that you necessarily, you know, have to be trained in or, or you know, go on sort of a workshop or anything. I think it's just about, you know, within um, teams creating that safe space and asking those open questions um, of team members, you know, how are you going? Where are you struggling? How can what what could we improve to make things um, you know better next time? Um, you know what are we learning? All sort of those open questions so we can understand you know where people are at, um, but ensuring that yeah we're we're allowing uh, people to answer you know honestly, um, and and the way to actually build that trust, which is fundamentally what you know that leader needs to have for that team to feel that safety. Um, is to express some of their own vulnerabilities. You know, how are they feeling? Where are they struggling? What's worked well? What hasn't? Um, what are some of those things they're doing, um, you know, to boost their well-being or their motivation at this time? I think, yeah. you know, just having those conversations um, is, is you know, sort of a really sort of simple step, but it's a really effective step. And unfortunately, you know, with a number of the organisations that I've been talking to, sometimes that, that gets missed. And it, it is something that is quite simple to do. And as I said, can have, you know, really great positive benefits for the individuals and the team. Yeah, to actually like um, really be more proactive or, or uh, about everything that, uh, that you're putting in place, de definitely. Now, with we have been talking about people that uh, are like in positions of leadership and, and like how their teams can increase their performance and uh, building that resilience from that aspect. But we also have, of course, a lot of people that have lost their job. Uh, mm -hmm. So how, how, how do you see that they can incorporate all of this? And have a growth mindset. Yeah, and and you know, there's no denying that um, there are so many people out there that you know, unfortunately, um, you know, are, are still struggling. And there's still so many fears around um, job security for people that are still sitting within their roles and and financial um, security. You know, these are big, big challenges and stresses that that people are facing right now. I guess, I guess, you know, from the field that, you know, I've studied, you know, despite the challenges that we go through, I think there is still that opportunity to adopt that, that the right mindset um, and to focus on those things that, you know, we can control as we've spoken about. So, mm. you know, even something like gratitude is something that can be done, you know, even when things aren't going right. You know, we always have opportunities to be grateful for things in our life. Um, mm. You know, they don't have to be big things. They can be as simple as, enjoying time in, in nature and in, in the sun or a great cup of coffee or having a really, um, you know, lovely conversation with, with a friend. Um, but, but what that actually does is, is it, tra it trains our brains when we practice this over time to start scanning our world for the positive as opposed to the negative. Um, you know, as human beings, unfortunately, we're, we're hardwired to focus on the negative in our lives because of, you know, this uh, negativity bias that's inherent within all of us. Um, yeah. You know, this bias actually helped our ancestors survive, you know, because they were constantly on the lookout for predators and threats to their survival. But these days it really does little for us, um, um, you know, so we, we need to have that, uh, you know, sort of effort and time and dedication to you know, thinking about all those things in our lives that we do have and that we're grateful for. And as I said, as we practice it over the time, you know, we rewire our brains to look for all those great things we have in our life as opposed to focusing on those things that we don't have. Yeah. And um, besides actually gratitude, one of the things that I say to to my guys in my, my group also is like to um, stop really expecting things to come in a certain way and to be actually open to uh, exploring and be curious about opportunities, how they should come, so not be attached in the way. Because a lot of people, um, and that is external again, they expect things to come in a certain way. They, uh, If you're in between jobs, then you think like, okay, the job should be advertised, I should apply on Seek or LinkedIn, and I should 
then receive an interview and blah, 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 and the rest go, goes on. But it's like, um, okay, let's look at it from a different angle. Let's change the, the pink glasses you have been looking through. Let's, let, let's put on purple glasses and just see what else we can explore and, and, and discover because like just focusing on one avenue is like just limiting uh, your, the, the opportunities that are presented to you. And also like, you're going to be very disappointed because it's like rejection after rejection that you get as a job seeker. And that is demoralizing, the soul destroying and your confidence just goes out of the window, to be honest. Mm. You need to protect that in, 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 in general, uh, de definitely. Um, so mm. we also talked, so we talked about what you can control and what you can't control. But what is, you, you spoke earlier on, like about the growth mindset. So what do you mean by having a growth mindset, Anna? Sure. So there's sort of those two differences between um, these types of uh, mindsets. And this comes from Carol Dweck's work, um, who's a researcher in the United States who's explored mindsets um, a lot and, and started off her career as a, as a teacher and, and now, um, you know, is, is a researcher. And what she suggests is that um, there's these two differences in the mindset. So firstly, you know, there's that fixed mindset and, and people that have that fixed mindset believe that their skills and their abilities and their intelligence is fixed. So it's fixed from birth. You can't get any more intelligent despite how hard you might try. Mm -hmm. um, whereas people with a growth mindset believe that, you know, with maybe coaching and training and, and their own sort of studies, they're able to, um, you know, build on their intelligence, their skills and their abilities. Um, one of the easiest ways or the best ways that I've found to actually flip your own mindset, and that's some great news, is that you have that ability to change mindsets, is by embracing the word yet. So when you think about things like, I can't do this, by adding a yet on the end, you've actually changed a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. One of the ways I've, I've illustrated this to people recently is actually thinking about, you know, virtual conferencing. You know, at the start of the year, this was so foreign to so <laughs> many of us. We, we didn't know what, you know, Zoom was or how to no. you know, do a breakout room or a virtual whiteboard. And, and now it's second nature <laughs> to, to many yeah. of us. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, think about when that challenge came about. So when all of a sudden, um, you know, we were, we were working from home and we had to run, you know, client meetings or team meetings via um, virtual conferencing, what was your natural reaction? Mm. So did you think, oh, my gosh, I can't do this. Uh, this is going to be a complete flop. How is the client going to, you know, how are we going to keep them engaged? How am I going to keep the team engaged? Um, you know, this is awful. Or did you think, you know what, with a little bit of, you know, skilling or someone showing me the ropes, um, probably doing a bit of my own research, I can actually build the skill set to be able to run a really engaging team or, or client meeting. Yeah. And I guess that's a way to sort of demonstrate the differences in those mindsets. And as I said, by embracing that word yet, so I might not have the skills yet to run that Zoom conference, but do you know what? John here is going to show me. You've automatically changed your mindset to that growth mindset. Yeah. And then the, the learning curve starts because have you ever seen um, um, FFTs from Brene Brown? Yes. <laughs> yeah. so, and so that is basically because we're all senior managers. And so a lot of people, when they do something for the first time, they just like, oh, my God, it, it doesn't work. And they throw the baby out with the bathwater water, and they're just like, this doesn't work for me. This just like <laughs> so, and and that is also part of then uh, from your definition or from from the what I could hear about growth mindset. It's also like okay, once you made that shift to I can't do this yet, uh, then you also have to acknowledge this might be the first time that I'm doing this, and this is going to suck. I'm going to suck at this. This is not going to be perfect. They are just like, it's going to be messy all over the place. And at the end of it, I'm going to say like, I better go, and go home and hand in my resignation because this was a total failure. But then you learn and then you become a master over time in, in something else. So how does this apply to job seekers? How would this same thing uh, apply to, to job seekers? Yeah, I, I think that there's similar concepts that can be applied to anyone's situation. So, 
you know, for people that are looking for work, you know, as you were saying earlier, you know, rarely do opportunities sort of land in front of us. Um, mm. You know, that sort of happens to a very few sort of fortunate people. Um, it is about getting yourself uncomfortable and, and being very proactive about, yeah, looking for work. Um, but but trying to put, um, you know, whilst, you know, you might be waiting or, or um, you know, waiting for those opportunities to occur, about thinking about ways that you can undertake some, um, you know, potentially more skilling or whatever it may be to actually, um, you know, develop um, more of those talents and abilities that you might need in those, in those future roles. You know, we know, um, you know, sitting in that, um, in that comfortable zone, you know, if rarely anything good happens there, right? We, we just get, you know, sort of bored and very complacent and there's no growth or development. But it's when we push ourselves outside of that comfort zone is when we we do um, start to see, you know, progression and um, positive changes and, and lots of growth and development and new skills and we use our strengths. So, um, yeah. you know, it's about us getting comfortable with the uncomfortable and, and moving outside of there. But that's where we find that those opportunities, um, you know, tend to occur. Yeah, and like not staying and doing the same thing all the time again and again, knowing that you you're not it's not going to deliver you the results that you that you want. I see a lot of people just like bashing their head against the brick wall uh, to actually get a different outcome, but they keep on doing the same thing. And they look at the past often and they say like, yeah, but it worked in the past. It's like, yes, but it doesn't mean if it worked in the past that it's going to work now. And so mm -hmm. it's so it's not easy to see, but it's so um, you okay. In your professional opinion, can you have a growth mindset in certain areas, but not in other areas? Is that possible, or do you have an overall growth mindset? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think anything is possible, and it and it depends on you know what's what's in front of you. I mean, I'm not going to say that I'm someone that has a growth mindset every you know second of every day. You know, certainly you know, we can get sort of overwhelmed by, you know, challenges and, and difficulties and, and setbacks. And, and that's that's normal. We can't sort of just sweep it under the rug and, and say, oh, you know, be all Pollyanna-ish and, you know, tomorrow will be better. And as you said, put on those rose-coloured glasses. Um, you know, we need to sort of acknowledge that, you know, those challenges are a normal part of life, but we need to sort of have that, that toolkit or those resources to be able to, um, you know, bounce back from those challenges and that's when we start to talk about things like uh, resilience. Um, you know, it, so it is really hard. You know, I'm, I'm you know, I, I definitely feel for people out there that, you know, unfortunately have lost their jobs and then, you know, are potentially applying for positions that, you know, are going to be so much more popular given so many people are out of work at the moment. Um, mm. But I think, you know, trying to position yourself in that best possible life, um, life sorry, as a candidate um, for that recruiter, um, is something that you can do and that is in your control and that might be around, you know, um, building new skills and, and certainly places like Coursera have had so many free um, courses available to people. Um, I've done a few with universities in the United States that, you know, you never would have thought you had the opportunity to participate in before. Yeah, exactly. And you you highlighted a very good point. It's about like uh, looking at what's at what's in your control. And if you would to have the the circles that you have about what's in your control, and what's out your outside your control, it's like um, what I see with the the group of people that are working within my program is that as senior managers, you often take yourself for granted. And so we do that. We do weekly interview training. And yesterday there was like we do 90 minutes of inter interview training uh, with the group and we go into breakout areas. And uh, uh, I gave feedback to somebody. And afterwards, uh, we all came back into the main room and he was saying, it's like, actually, like you're, 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 you're spot on. My example that I would give in an interview doesn't have enough gravity or is, is deep enough because I took for granted what I did in that project because like I didn't see it the 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 validity so coming back to how you what's in your control is actually taking this time and really reflect on yourself and get to connect with you um, because a lot of people have been drifting through their career going from job to job and never really Take, took the time to stop and look around. It's like, who am I? What what makes me good in what I do? And uh, stop taking yourself for granted. To be honest, <laughs> uh, 
Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's that's such a good point is that, yeah, so often again, you know, we we reflect mm. on the bad as opposed to, you know, all the great things and the achievements and and celebrating successes is a is a really important thing and reflecting back on all those great things that have occurred. Um, so, yeah, yeah def definitely and, taking and, the time to do that. And that comes back to the gratitude that you say said before. It's like because one of the aspects also that um, has come to light more and more uh, today is self-care and self-love. And people can say like, oh, that's fluffy, Caroline. Like, I don't care. Like, you, you, it all starts with you. If you want to see change in the outside environment, you have to change inside. And a lot of people are just focusing on the outside and not changing first on the inside. And that doesn't work this way. You can't wait till the outside changes and then you say like, oh, then I will love myself or then I'll be happy. Or then it's like, no, you have to be happy with you first. So often reflecting on yourself and appreciating yourself and showing gratitude and self-love for yourself is a, is a starting point. And people get it really mixed up the other way around often. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, you know, we did speak a lot around um, the self-care and, and the gratitude piece. And it is also about expressing it towards others. Um, you mm. know, so often we we forget to thank people and, and show our appreciation for, for good work or whatever else they might have done. Um, and that's a really important thing to consider right now is, you know, how are you showing others um, that you appreciate them, whether that's in your, you know, sort of professional your or your personal life? Um and that's a really, um, you know, again, despite sort of all those challenges, again, focusing on that positive and um, showing people that, you know, you care and, and you're appreciating what they're doing. Yeah, I think that's a good. So let's give everybody that like watching live or watching the replay uh, a task. So what are the three things they can do today to actually start shifting a little bit and becoming more uh, in a growth mindset? So what what's your what's your recommendations, Anna? <laughs> Well, I think one of the um, best things to think about at the moment um, with so much negativity around is how are you boosting that positivity in your life? Um, you know, Barbara Fredrickson, who's one of the leading researchers in the world on sort of emotions and positive emotions, suggests that there's a ratio of three to one. So every one negative emotion you experience, you need to compensate for that with three positive emotions. And pretty much everyone that I talk to at the moment is not getting close to that ratio um, because unfortunately there is so much negativity around with the coronavirus. Right. So what um, you know, I'd love everyone to to think about when they step away from here is how can you boost the positivity every day in your life? Now that might be expressing gratitude, and we've, we've spoken about ways you could do that. It might be performing a random act of kindness. So that might be you know cooking for someone um, in our street. Um, you know, all our neighbours were sort of sharing meals now. We'll make a big batch of food and, and drop it off on a few doorsteps might be sending someone flowers or, or sending someone a nice text message. You know, it doesn't have to be sort of huge gestures. It could be something mm. quite small. Um, so that's kindness. Or, you know, it could be about injecting humour into your day. You know, how can we, you know, share a funny YouTube clip, appropriate one, um, you know, in the workplace <laughs> or, you know, a, a joke at the start of meetings. You know, these are really good ways that we can actually, you know, boost that positivity, which actually helps us, you know, sort of, broaden our, our minds and our thoughts and, and um, enables us to be better problem solvers and to overcome challenges. Um, but the best thing about positive emotions that I've, I've uncovered through uh, Fredrickson's work is that, you know, the more you experience positivity now, what actually happens is it goes into almost like a, an account, like a, a savings account at a bank so that you can then draw upon it in the future. Hmm. So the more you have it today, the more when you face a challenge and a setback in the future, it can actually be used as, um, you know, something like resilience. And I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. I, and I think the challenge is for people to get their head around this and actually because they can't see it, it's not tangible. They can't say like, like look, look, look at my bank account. <laughs> How yeah. much is in there? How much positivity have I up to, um, uh, up to do it? So they can't really see it. And I think that that is a challenge, but you will have the benefits of doing that. And you just have to have faith and believe that that is what, what you're doing is, is developing you, yourself. Um, yeah. Anything else that they can do? I mean, there's there's so much to um, to boost well-being and resilience. Um, I think that first thing is maybe doing that stock take on where you're at, and and there's yeah. certainly surveys out there to help people. 
um, you know, being more optimistic, you know, optimistic is something, optimism, sorry, is something that we can learn, which is, which is really great. So um, being more optimistic about the future is a great way, um, you know, to, to face those challenges. Um, leveraging your strengths. So what are those things you're naturally good at and that give you energy and how can they be used, um, you know, during challenging times? Um, there's some of the ways that we can also, uh, yeah, boost well-being and resilience, um, but also thinking about how you're going to recover from that stress and anxiousness that potentially um, you're feeling as well. And that's yeah, by doing yeah. some of those things that we all know, you know, around sleeping well, eating well, exercise, and as we touched on earlier, you know, practising mindfulness as well. Yeah, exactly. So um, just to come back, did we mention the three things that people can take away and they can, they can do today? That was like, um, I'm just like recapping. <laughs> Sorry, I've probably, I've covered a lot. And um, look, in terms of the boosting the positivity, I would suggest, you know, the, the gratitude piece. So expressing yep. gratitude, if that's through the three good things exercise. Yep. The Perfect. second one was, you know, thinking about performing random acts of kindness, which might be, yep. you know, um, buying a coffee for someone, text message or sending flowers, et cetera. Um, and then the third one is, you know, injecting that humour into your day, whether that's with your, yeah. your friends or your colleagues as well. Yes, exactly. And I would say, like, um, what a good way to to show that appreciation piece on the second one and show, do a, 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 a random act of kindness is actually if you're a leader at the moment, uh, like, talk to your team and reach out to them and, like, say what they're good at. Like, give them feedback when they don't expect it uh, because they will need it, I can promise you. Uh, and it will be so good for them to hear that from, from you. Uh, if you're in in between jobs, like uh, there's so many ways that you can actually do a random act of kindness. But if you say like you want it in your in a professional way, then uh, maybe there is somebody that you can refer uh, and do that. Also, reach out to somebody that you might be able to help, whether it's like helping them uh, with reviewing their uh, uh, asking, like, can I help you with your interview skills or resume, or can I introduce you to anybody in my network? But think about how you can actually repay them. And, of course, you can also cook dinners and stuff like that for people. <laughs> you can do that. Perfect. Definitely. So one last thing that I, I wanted to, to see if you could share, um, how can people connect with you, work with you? Like, tell us a little bit about more about that, Anna. Yeah, sure. So um, at the moment what I've been doing a lot with teams is running masterclasses or workshops around some of these positive psychology concepts. So things like, you know, how to thrive in, in um, your new reality or how to build resilience or how to, you know, stay engaged and productive at home. Uh, they're probably the most popular topics um, lately. Uh, but on top of that, I also run uh, individual and group coaching sessions as well, all around sort of these positive psychology elements, which is about, you know, sort of boosting engagement, performance and wellbeing. Um, mm -hmm. So I also write regularly. So I've got a regular blog each fortnight. It comes out with some of these sort of tips and strategies. So yep. for people that want more information, you know, they can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or sign up um, to my newsletter, which is at anaglin.com.au. Um, yep. And I'll also be hosting a um, open masterclass in a couple of weeks for people uh, if they're interested in attending as well. Perfect. And so the best way for, for them to actually um, get in contact with you would be that on their newsletter, uh, connect with you on LinkedIn um, or any of the other social media platforms and it's all under your name? Is yes, that right? that's right. Yes, yes. And for anyone that's interested in having, you know, more of a chat about how I might be able to help, I'm happy to organise, um, you know, a complimentary 30-minute session as well. Perfect. Brilliant. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was invaluable, the information that you shared today. And uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, uh, please reach out to Anna if you want to take this any further or if you have any questions. Um, she's more than happy there to, to, to help you. And um, if you have any questions, if you're not connected with her and you want to be introduced, reach out to me and I will uh, more than happy introduce her to, to you. Thank you again, Anna, and um, yeah, I will hopefully talk to you soon. Thank you, Caroline. Thanks for having me, and yeah, thanks.